Good morning, all. I'm Ashin Kriner, and I'm here to present my talk, Light Simulations for Dark Matter. My talk has three major components. I will start by talking about the challenge that we face in this role. I'm going to talk about what dark matter is and how particle detectors are used to pick it up. Then I'm going to talk specifically about the configuration of the LZ experiment, which I'm supporting. I'm going to talk about the role simulations play within this project and how the difference between CPU-based simulations currently used and the GPU-based simulations we're implementing will lead to a potential for a 1,000x speed gain. I'm then going to discuss the challenges around developing a suitable benchmark for quantifying the performance of this system based upon its speed and accuracy. I'm then going to discuss the solution that we are developing. I'm going to talk about how we will integrate a existing ray tracing framework into the current pipeline of the software system. I'm going to talk about the design of the solution we have to implement. I'm going to talk about containerization and its use in the context of this project. And I'm going to talk about the components of the design that needs to be fit in, which are the geometry of the detector itself and the photons produced by an in particle. The container has been built, as you'll see, and I'll talk about some of the steps that are involved in carrying that out. We have some test cases in place. And again, I'll talk about the different test cases that are in play here. I will talk about the collaboration that we have, both with LZ and with the developer of one of our components, the framework optics by Sam Bly. And I'll briefly thank NVIDIA for the support that they're providing. Finally, I will talk about the steps that are involved in a software upgrade. Particle detectors are used for a number of scientific applications, including dark matter. Particle detectors are fairly widespread, and the work we're doing here will have multiple applications across the scientific domain. Dark matter is the invisible background to much of the universe. 85% of the mass of the universe is dark matter, but it is invisible. We do not observe it directly. And what we wish to do then, therefore, is to observe it by observing the behavior of other bodies. Much like when we do a wrecking ball or we see a flag, we can infer quite a lot of details of the object, whether it's heavy or light, and what material it's made of, based upon observing it from a distance, how they behave very differently in a breeze. Well, when we look for dark matter, we observe rotating galaxies, and we can tell based on the speed of rotation, their approximate mass and the approximate mass distribution. So we're pretty confident that there is dark matter. But the question is, what is it? And one of the major candidates is a weakly interacting massive particle, or WIMP. Now, a WIMP is weakly interacting. It interacts only occasionally. We detect individual interactions with other matter in a particle detector. That's what the role of this apparatus is. When a weakly interacting particle comes in, it interacts with baryonic matter, and we observe the results of that interaction. This technique is quite similar to that used in other particle accelerator detector experiments, and therefore we can see the potential for the techniques developed in this project to be applied in a wider sense. LZ specifically is a next generation dark matter detector. What happens is an inbound particle comes into the tank uh, full of liquid xenon and interacts with the xenon. Now, this produces a cascade of particles, and those particles themselves cause ionization of the xenon gas. That ionization leads to freed electrons, which will at some point recombine to form neutral atoms again. In doing so, that will produce a burst of photons. The particular shape and pattern of that burst of photons, as detected with the photomultiplier tubes, you can see on the top and bottom of the detector in the image here can reconstruct the original particle, reconstruct the amount of energy deposited, the time that energy was deposited over, and so on. And from that, calculate the nature of the original particle. What we do is we simulate a real observation and then compare the output of the photomultiplier tubes with the simulated interaction, and therefore identify the original particle from that, by right? fitting it to one of the simulated curves. Current simulations use Gion4. Gion4 is a CPU-based particle interaction model, and it's quite good for very high energy particles, simulating their side products, their outputs, and so on. It is used for the high energy end of the simulations. 
But to continue that propagation down to low energy particles, when one high energy particle comes in, many low energy photons are produced at the end of the process. And the propagation of those is a very time and resource intensive simulation bottleneck. It uses a lot of memory and does a lot of calculations. So what we propose to do is move those simulations to graphics processing units. Now, graphics processing units are designed to do high-speed optical simulation. They're designed to do computer games. And if you can produce Doom Guy at 120 frames per second, that involves a lot of ray tracing optical particles. As a result, we have a prediction that in the simulation step specifically, we will get a thousand times increase in the speed of this pipeline. Now that will enable us to do more frequent simulations and more simulations. And that will allow us to really fix up the simulation model that we have to use and make better use of the available hardware. A disadvantage of using GPUs is that GPU calculations are not direct translations of CPU programs. What you need to make good use of a GPU is many inputs that do many parallel calculations. And that produces a very different set of patterns to the more linear patterns that you might expect for a traditional CPU-based system. Another challenge exists in implementing the correct benchmark. Now, the measure for success is, of course, to outperform the existing solution. But the existing solution is, in fact, two existing solutions. The first is a full simulation of all of the photons in the CPU. And this is, as I said, memory intensive and slow. This is not frequently used. In fact, more frequently, the simulations use a light map, which is an approximation of the system, and it's functional, but it has limits to its accuracy. Our GPU-based upgrade, we can reasonably expect it to be faster than the full simulation, and we can reasonably expect it to be more accurate than the light. We want it to outperform the full simulation for accuracy, we want it to outperform the light map for speed. If it does so, excellent. If it does not, we need to be able to measure the trade-off between these. And that remains an open question at this time because there are two major components to this, both called optics. And as a result, I have used the color coding system you see here, the green color code for the NVIDIA system, and the red color code for Simon Blythe's system, which is built on this. So NVIDIA's system is a scalable framework for building ray tracing based applications. It is a general purpose ray tracing solution. It is designed to carry these simulations on NVIDIA GPUs. What it's not is a purpose built particle physics simulator. So it's not designed to take particle physics inputs. Simon Blythe has built an input called optics with a CK which takes NVIDIA's optics, which is optics with an X, imports Geon4 geometries and photon gensept into the opt NVIDIA's framework. Therefore, Blythe's optics acts as a wrapper around NVIDIA's optics and allows you to import a particle physics simulation into that framework and then use that framework to use the GPUs. Containerization makes the software both fixed and portable and allows us to make the best use of the systems that we have. Containerization has a few advantages. First of all, it allows us to standardize the points. We know exactly what libraries are available because we have created them in the container. It allows us to port them from a development system to a test system and from our test system to the production system, which will eventually be pro -op. A container also allows us to fix uh, versions such that they are the versions that we need. And if we are dependent on some external software, we can bundle that up together with our package and allows us to use that in our system. There are a few cautionary notes about this approach. If there are software upgrades, for example, to patch vulnerabilities, those vulnerabilities will persist as the new version is not replaced in your containerized version. In addition, building in dependencies on particular versions and then baking them into a container does lead to the potential for the upgrades or rebuilds of the container to be laborious. So you need to be cognizant of that. The solution we intend to implement here is a layered and encapsulated one where we keep our software from becoming too entangled with one another. So our API is being developed to allow LZ's high energy simulation to interact with optic. And what we have at the moment is we have a LZ geometry, which shouldn't change much, but there is potential for updates and upgrades to that. And LZ photons, which are generated by the LZ high energy simulations. 
we need to connect those into the optics framework. We will be building an automated system and API to do that. We have Blythe's optics, which will allow us to exploit the capabilities of NVIDIA's optics within the containerized environment. This allows us to lock in versions as they are ready for development, and we will enable stepwise upgrades with from stable version to stable version while carrying out the development outside of the context of the deployed version. Shifter is a requirement for using images and containers on Cordy GPU and is likely to persist forward to Chrome To use Shifter, we build a Docker image externally to Shifter and then export it to Shifter. Shifter does impose some restrictions that Docker does not. For example, Shifter images are read only and cannot be written to, and Shifter users do not have root access. This constrains what we can do with them and therefore requires that we do as much as possible in the Docker development environment. To develop Docker, we write a Docker file with all of the commands required to build our environment, and we create an image with all of our dependencies, all the specific versions, we bundle those up, put those up to Docker Hub, from where they can be pulled down to Shifter. In principle, this should be a very portable solution. Our solution should continue to work when we upgrade to Perlmutter, and indeed, if other users adopt our approach, that should also enable them to benefit from this. The input of the photons and the geometry to the system is one that has to be automated. Now, there are two things about this. So geometry files are GM4 files with the GDML extension, and they describe a detector. They describe the size, the shape, and the optical properties built up from a series of primitives. These photons are generated separately using the high energy physics simulation pipeline, and we then need to input those into this system. At the moment, they're input manually. Uh, this is not really a scalable solution. There are some proposed solutions, one of which is to migrate the generation steps as well. This is the problem of interfacing the CPU-based high energy simulations with the low energy GPU simulations, perhaps too tightly. And there are some concerns about the modularity of that and the portability of that to other solutions. So what we're looking to do with this to come up with a modular scalable API that will allow this system to integrate with the LZ workflow when it is needed. Containerization comes with its own challenges. And in our particular case, there are three major sets of challenges that need to be addressed. So Blythe's Optics comes with a set of built-in assumptions about the availability of access to the software, access to certain paths within the system. It has some of those paths hard-coded or at least semi-hard-coded with tokens like the home path written into several of the scripts. There are places where a naive user might not expect writes to disk being carried out in the code that will prevent running in a read-only environment such as a ship or container. Optics also depends upon certain specific versions and commits of some of its dependencies, and therefore we do have to be a little cautious about ensuring that those are all in place and that later upgrades do not get installed if they are breaking for the future system. NVIDIA's Optics also imposes a number of challenges. Some of its libraries are hardware aware once compiled, and therefore we need to be cautious about setting the libraries with the correct configuration for the hardware that is to be used. For example, B100 versus A100 NVIDIA chipsets. If this is not done, this will cause a runtime mismatch with the drivers and is quite difficult to overcome. We also have to face the security restrictions of writing and locations that can be written to by a shifter user, and this has to be addressed by separating those out. A number of workarounds have been used to create a usable test image for the current stage of the progress. Shifter images are read-only, and therefore what we have done is we have created, launched the container uh, in its read-only environment, and then copied its contents to a writable partition, which can be accessed from within the image. Those contents are then launched again with the correct directories mounted. This allows us to complete the set setup of optics, including a number of write commands, and allows us to run test code, edit scripts, develop code, in mounted directories instead of in the raw image. We do want to move to a more sustainable solution. Passing things to, for example, the scratch directory on Cori GPU is not necessarily the ideal solution, 
but it is one that works for development processes and further updates will provide more flexibility. We have also carried out a number of successful tests. You can see a small sample of those being carried out there on the side of the screen. Blides Optics was originally built with the Juno and Deo Bay experiments in mind, and their geometries are bundled with the package and are available for use. The LC geometry is significantly more complex, and the initial version that we're working with has an imbalanced tree structure to it, which causes test runs run on the LZ to run significantly slower than the test runs run on the Juno and Deo Bay geometries. We also encounter some errors with some of the LT tests. Those are being worked on by one of my collaborators, Sam Erickson, but most of them it's simply that they're running slower, which means that iteration cycles of tests using the LC geometry are necessarily going to be slower than iteration cycles using the Juno or Deo geometries. As a result, for many purposes, we'll be testing the systems as any modifications and upgrades are carried out using the Juno or Deo Bay geometries. And then subsequently, once the iterative tests are completed, migrating to LZ. There have been a series of test photons generated within the LZ framework. Translation fees to the optics framework is not necessarily as trivial as we would like them to be. There has been a recommendation to generate the photons within the framework. This has the difficulty of integrating with the existing LZ workflow, and we're looking at solutions that allow this to be more modular. This particular project has shown considerable work in the form of collaboration. And there are two diametrically opposite forms of collaboration at work here. This human aspect is very important for many developers. And it's something I kind of wanted to draw attention to. The collaboration with LZ involves hundreds of scientists across many time zones working to fit many independently developed tools together. This requires continuous integration testing, clearly defined modularity, and separated I.O. that is well understood. Conversely, Optics was developed by a single developer, which means communicating is much easier, much easier to get information to one person than to many. But it does mean that there's less available time. There have been some issues around version dependencies. In particular, Blyde's Optics is based on NVIDIA's Optics version 6. And version 7 of NVIDIA Optics is not compatible with software written for version 6. As a result, we have had to get support from NVIDIA to give some assistance with this non-trivial upgrade and to implement the changes needed in the software, in the calls to the libraries based on the new system. In addition, some parts of Blythe's optics were built in Python 2.7 at present. The tests, for the most part, show success with either version, though it is potentially a concern. A number of other libraries upon which this system is based also have version dependencies. This, in some ways, is both a strength and a weakness of containerization. It's a strength in that containerization allows you to identify the libraries and versions that you wish to use, lock those in, and build your software with just those versions. It's a weakness in that it locks in these versions at that time. And if there are issues with those, it becomes burdensome to upgrade, in particular because it will require that the container itself be re uh, rebuilt. In conclusion, we have a science case with widespread applications. Our main science case in LZ is a cutting edge one in the form of dark matter which has strong implications in that it makes up 85% of the universe, but also the techniques applied in the dark matter search also have implications for neutrino particle detectors and a number of other detectors. Our solution to accelerating the simulation phase of this project has flexible potential. We have containerization that allows for portability, and while it doesn't solve everything, it does provide a solution that can be used on multiple devices with multiple configurations. The modularity that we're trying to build into our software solution again addresses this flexibility by making sure that we separate some of the central components of the software from one another and that we do not overly tie our design to a particular solution. This is a very much a work in progress. 
We have support from NVIDIA to really bring the best solution to the world. And we are giving support to LZ from NERSC to deliver a essential software update. There are my references. And finally, I will leave you on this conclusion slide. Thank you very much.